And again, uh, wanna, we want to say Happy Mother's Day. It, we, we are in a series, for those of you who may be new to Harvest, they're called Grow in the Dark. And uh, I feel like we have this temptation as a society and because of social media that during moments in days like Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, Easter, right, other special moments in our, just in the year, we, you know, we will do something fun with the people that we love, and we will be tempted to simply, you know, take it, capture that, we capture those moments, and we post those moments online. And the temptation for the Christian is to think that that's the way that life is, right? Like, we kind of just compartmentalize life into these moments, and that's what you see. So you go into any feed, and for the most part, well, you get the complainers too, right, on social media. But besides that, then you get all the people that are posting all the fun things they do. And it creates this pressure. And, and I think Julie and I have talked about this, my wife. Uh, we have talked about how, you know, it can create this pressure on moms or on dads or on teens and to live up to these standards that we see online that really aren't necessary. And what I, I think we can do and we have to recognize is that God is working through the good times in your life. But this series, Grow in the Dark, is designed to let us know how God is working even in the, during the hard stuff, even during the hard times. And so I could, you know, sit here and just tell you scriptures that you probably already have heard. But I think that when we see those scriptures lived out, it has a lot of power, you know, in, in what they say. And so what I did is I invited these three ladies, Michelle, Kristen, and Julie, to share some of their stories and to let you see how the Bible applies in how God is even given us light, even during times of darkness. And so we're going to do that. And I want you, over the next few minutes, as you listen, just pay attention to what God was doing during their sto- in their story, uh, just at each specific time of it. So we're going to start with Miss Kristen. Kristen Barron, uh, she sings in the worship team. You didn't see her today, but uh, she, she sings and she serves in many other places. She has a beautiful family. We're going to see a picture of them. Uh, Kristen, tell us, where were you at in this, in this picture? We were at Bucky's in Springfield. Um, it's pretty new. We were on our way to a soccer tournament for my middleest kid. All right. I love the, the jersey. And <laughs> Bucky's, how many of you have been to Bucky's? Okay, it's like the QT of the South, right? Yeah. Like that's a big, big deal in Texas, and it's coming up here. But Kristen, you have a beautiful family, but things haven't always been easy. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Okay, so um, summarize this here. Um, I was married to my children's father, and he was a great father and a great husband, and he had a lot of mental health issues. And unfortunately, he decided to take those issues to substance abuse, and um, things just kind of Gradually, I guess if over the course of about two years just got worse and worse to the point where I Had to take my kids and I had to get out of there. I had to protect them. I did not want a repeat of what I grew up with and so I made that choice um, kind of simultaneously to that I had been a Christian since I was a child. I knew who God was and I knew Jesus. Um, However, I would live my life for myself and would run to Jesus when things were rough, when things were hard, and then things would get better and I would just kind of go back to living my life the way I wanted to. And um, when things got really bad, once again, I did it again and I ran to God, but this time, it was a little different because I told him, I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be, but I also know that I'm not going to do what I should be on my own. I need you to just come through and change everything. Um, And I gave God permission to do that. I said, I don't know how to do it, so just come in and do whatever you have to do so that I follow you properly and get me out of this mess. And... That's exactly what he did. In retrospect, I'm able to see that he said, okay, I'm going to do it, but you're going to have to hang on tight. You're going to have to trust me, and I have to take away everything you created to replace it with my plan instead. So 
I had to move out. I left my teeny little house that I love so dearly. I had to leave my husband behind and take my kids to go live with my mother, which was a huge hit to my pride, um, but it was safe and it was healthy. And I had to yank my kids out of their school and put them to a new school. Um, my routine, everything I knew about life, everything that I had worked so hard to create was gone. Um, I, it was dark, it was scary, it was hard, um, probably the most miserable time of my life. But this time, since everything was gone, I had nothing but God. I had to lean on him, I had to trust him, and I didn't understand it. I was confused, I didn't know what was going to come, so I literally had nothing left. So that's when he held up his end of the deal and started to show up every way possible. And it took a lot of time. Um, it's been about five and a half years now. He's still showing up, but he's done a lot of work in my life. And a lot of that is um, just little bits and pieces. So for instance, when I had to move out, my husband's sister showed up. We had a relationship, but she showed up every single weekend to help me get out of that house, and she became my absolute best friend. Um, her and I are inseparable now. She's <laughs> very important to me, so he gave that to me. Um, I had long drives to work. Um, I was working in St. Charles, living out here at the time, and I would cry and pray and ask for clarity and just asked to help get me through this. And from the time I was itty bitty, God put music on my heart and I listened to a lot of Joy FM. And he spoke to me through those songs that I had heard a million times before that were just kind of songs in the background. But this time he was speaking to me big time. Um, Oceans was one of those. Keeping our eyes above the waves. Um, losing my home, my husband, my routine, my dreams, my marriage, everything. What that taught me, growing up was kind of chaotic for me. I had no control over anything. And so as I got to be late teens, early 20s, I decided I'm, I'm just going to control everything. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to make a way. I am going to make sure that I am safe and that I get what I want. And all of a sudden, I didn't have that control anymore. And he taught me we can't, we're not in control, he is in control. And he taught me how to let go of that control. I have since obtained a peace that I cannot explain. It's simply from him. Um, so going forward when things get rocky or hard, instead of panicking and anxiety, and I, I look at it now as, it's okay. I have no idea what he's gonna do, but he's gonna move and he's gonna take care of us and everything is gonna be okay. And it's so beautiful to have that peace and to not live life with a tight wound anxiety any longer. Um, I was so unsure about my kids. I was terrified. I didn't want them to grow up without their dad. I didn't know what that would look like for my two girls. I was pregnant with my son at the time and I was devastated to think that he's not gonna have his father to raise him to show him how to be a man and how am I ever gonna do that? Um, so what he did with that was things I never would have done. He made a way to put them into Christian schools. So they're in school, they're in church, they're hearing the word of Jesus every single day to hopefully prepare them so that when life gets hard for them, they will also have that firm foundation to stand on. Um, he's provided a village beyond my wildest dreams to help me take care of my kids. And that is a beautiful thing. I wasn't going to church myself, and because I had nothing to rely on anymore but God, I clung to him like crazy, and I finally started going to church and bringing my kids, and from that, I have came up with this amazing church family, and again, more of my village to help love us and take care of us and to be there when we need them. Um, like I said, he's put a song in my heart since I was a little bitty kid, and for the first time ever, I found why he designed me to do that, to get up here and put those emotions through that songs for other people to hear, for other people to connect with. Um, but I think the main thing is he gave me a testimony. Um, I don't talk about it too much, but sometimes I get put in a position where I have to talk about it and people look at me 
and they just say, how do you do it? How could you survive this? How can you get through all of that? And I have no other choice but to say, it's not me, <laughs> it's Jesus, and that's real. That's not just something to say because a Sunday school teacher told me to. It is dead real. And I can see those people, the response they have. I can see their wheels turning in their mind to say, who is this Jesus, and how, did, how does this all make sense? Um, and on top of that, I'm not, a share, I'm not afraid to share my faith anymore. I used to keep it tucked quiet, and now... <laughs> I'm known to walk around work singing all day, and any, any situation that comes up, I bring God into it, and that is a beautiful thing. So for me to have been transformed, I will never do it different. I'm so thankful for all of those hard times that now I can point other people to Jesus. Um, he used my hard story for that purpose. I believe it. So it takes me back to scriptures when... Jesus called Peter out on the water. He had that faith, and he was walking on water, and he began to let that faith waver, and he began to sink. And so, you know, I put that together with you got to look above the waves. you got to look over the top. you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Know that no matter what plans we can dream up, his plans for us will always be better than anything we could ever imagine. So let go. It's okay to let go and just know that he's got something better for us and even if you don't understand it you say God I'm confused I don't get it why is this happening just be able to look at him and say I know that you're going to come up with something great and one day I might understand it and one day I might not but you're moving and changing lives every single day and that's good enough for me Amen. Yeah. that's it's so good. One of the things that you're going to notice is as their stories are uniquely shaped by the Lord, there are still some ways in which God works in every single story and in your story as well. And so um, I asked my wife, Julie, to just share a little bit about her story and, and uh, just uh, tell us about it. There's a picture of our family, which you know, uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about what God is doing in, in your life. Yeah. So I, too, have had um, several dark times in my life, starting with childhood sexual abuse that I didn't disclose to anybody till I was in college. Looking back, I can see how God protected me every step of the way. I, didn't, I did not understand it then, um, but he took me to St. Louis Christian College, and... Um, I was able to experience counseling for the first time there, and I met my wonderful husband there. Um, That's me, by the way. <laughs> um, soon after we were married, Caleb came, and I was a newlywed, I was a new mom, and I still had so much pain and anxiety that um, I didn't know what to do with, so I stuffed it way far down because I didn't want to think about it. After uh, my son Caleb turned one, um, I found out I was pregnant again. And I did not want to be pregnant again yet. I was really upset about it. I pouted. I was a big baby. I was ungrateful. I was not ready for the blessing that God gave me. A few months later, though, I had a miscarriage. <laughs> for a while, I thought the miscarriage was my fault for not wanting the baby. My world was turned upside down. I couldn't, I couldn't put it together that one day I was pregnant and the next day I wasn't, even though I didn't really want to be. I went through several months of depression after that. But God is funny. 
sometimes. My mom would tell me a lot over my life that it was my generation to have twins. I would tell her, that's never going to happen. <laughs> not to me, because I'm not an organized person. I fly by the seat of my pants. I am not a schedule person. And having one baby, you know, at the time even, I was like, eh, it's whatever. Uh, then the next year, God um, blessed us with twins. <laughs> For the next several years, I was living in a cycle of survival mode, mothering three small children and trying to deal with the trauma of my past. I'll take that. In 2014, Gus became the campus pastor here. He began to notice that our community was in desperate need of some kind of recovery program. So he researched Celebrate Recovery, and this is a program that helps anyone with any hurt, habit, or hang-up. And um, so we went to St. Charles to visit one of the groups to check it out. While I was there, I realized that I needed that group. There was something within that group that I just, I knew that would help me with my healing. Right after we started this program here at the church, a woman came to our church just needing space to do some counseling, not knowing that she was going to help bring about even more healing for me, Gustavo allowed her to do her counseling sessions here. Even when I wasn't looking for healing, God was bringing things to the church for me and for many others to bring about healing and real change in their lives. During the difficult years of my counseling, I would try to get into his word, but I would just find myself distracted or too exhausted to be able to really give him my focus. But he was always so patient with me and my immaturity. He was tenderly loving me and showing me how to love myself and how to love my husband and my kids. I would feel at times that there were more things I needed to do for the ladies here at the church because that's what pastor's wives are supposed to do, right? do all these things, but I thought I had nothing I could offer. I didn't know enough. I would beat myself up because I wasn't sure I was a good enough Christian. Um, he since showed me that I am very relatable to many women in different walks of life, but all I have to do is just love him and love the people around me. It seems that God, though, has allowed chronic pain to be a part of my walk in these last few years. Um, in 2015, when, when Gus was pa past, or, uh, had recently become campus pastor, I dislocated my jaw, and it stayed dislocated for just over a year. I would plead, and I would pray for God to fix my jaw. I endured two surgeries before it was finally fixed. At that time, I thought I needed to be a certain way or do things a certain way so that he would heal me. I prayed that year that, you know, God, just fix my jaw. Like, I don't understand. I, I'm not sure that I really ever got, like, an answer um, about it, but um, the doctor on my case, my surgery was in December that year, and the doctor on my case um, I think saw our desperation and knew that if we went into the new year before my surgery was performed, I'd have to pay for the surgery all over again. So he um, changed his days off so that I could have the surgery that I needed. I have also had back pain that um, from sports injury from high school. Um, but when we started homeschooling our kids in 2018, my back went out for the first time. And it's gone out several times since then. And again, I, I plead with God, like, can you just fix it? Like, just poof, make it better. Um, but he always just gently reminds me that his grace is sufficient for me. 
And this year, while we were in Africa, we had been praying and praying and praying that he would heal me before we left. And um, he didn't. And that's okay, because while I was there, I felt God tell me that I needed to feel the pain of the people. These people go through so much pain. You all go through so much pain, right? And I think maybe for me, I need to remember that people go through pain. It hurt me to hear him say that, but because of my pain right now, I can relate with others when they are experiencing pain or painful situations. Lately, I'm realizing that I need him to get through each day, not just what he can do for me. He's not a genie in a bottle. I have to say there have been many times where I've been unsure of what he's doing in my life through pain, the pain of abuse or chronic pain that I've experienced, but I can see and the ways that he has put things in place um, to help me. Even now with my back pain that I'm going through, sometimes I still don't understand why he allows me to go through this pain, but you know, I, I still wonder, is there more character development that needs to happen? Is there, you know, I'm self-forgetful. I don't take care of myself very well before others. And maybe I need to be aware of that. I don't know what he's doing right now, but I do know that in spite of the pain that I go through, he is here with me, walking alongside of me. I feel that he's given me brief moments of little to no pain, and in those moments, I am so refreshed in my soul that I just stop whatever I'm doing and I thank him. And I don't think I would have done that before. God always seems to bring me back to Psalms 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. So many times I thought, you know, it's just about what I do for him. But all he wants is me. He just wants these quiet times to be with me and enjoy his presence. James 1, 2 through 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I would often wonder, how can trials make us joyful? <laughs> but what I'm coming to learn is that hard times definitely bring me more faith, and more faith brings me more joy. He has all of my tomorrows. In him, there is joy. So if you're struggling with depression or pain, know that God is graciously walking beside you, guiding you, giving you strength. And when you feel like that you can't do anymore, he is the one picking you up and carrying you through because he loves you. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jules. Uh, so, you know, as I, you, you, as I knew a little bit about your story, Kristen, here and there, and then, of course, I knew Julie's story. Um, recently, we just kind of got to know Michelle, uh, and, uh, you know, just hearing the little bits and pieces, as I was praying about, you know, just this weekend, I decided to ask her, and I appreciate you wanting to share, and you want to see Michelle's family. Uh, Michelle's married to Sean over there, and they're a large family. I love it because when the Huckabas show up, you know at least one row is going to be full, right? Uh, but uh, you sent another picture, Michelle. Uh, tell us about this picture. That was the vacation we took at the end of the first year that I was a single mom of 10. So you had all your kiddos with you. That, yeah, that's amazing. So, Michelle, thanks for wanting to share uh, this morning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? When... You asked me to share how God has brought light into the dark times in my life. It was pretty overwhelming because God has been so faithful to me, and I've needed him desperately, continually. As a young woman, I thought I'd survived a lot. I was the oldest child of a bipolar single mom. I'd lived in both the projects and in a house with no indoor plumbing doors or windows. The first time a grown man punched me, I was four. At 13, I was called to testify against my pedophile stepfather and I moved out on my own at 17. God had blessed me with a resilient spirit, but as we often do, I took that blessing and I ran way too far with it. God doesn't just intend to get you to the other side of hard times. 
He uses them to draw you to him and to form you as his own. So he began to break that resilient spirit. In 2004, my younger brother was killed in Iraq. He was just 21. We were devastated, but he was honored as a hero. I pushed through, leaning on my faith and knowing that there was a bigger purpose. And then a few years later, my 18-year-old baby brother was killed in an alcohol-related car accident. Grief does this weird thing in your brain, and every pain that I'd ever felt came rushing over me all at once. I was so angry at God that I told him I wasn't going to believe in him, which was silly since I was talking to him. He pointed out a tree to me. What about that tree? And I couldn't deny his work. Okay, but if you love us, why don't you protect us from this kind of pain? I got truly honest with God. He walked me through the anger and the pain over the course of a year or so. Standing in the shower sobbing one day, I humbled and I admitted that I may never know why, but I trusted him and I thanked him for taking my brothers. Cementing that trust in him was needed for what was yet to come. December 17th of 2014, my husband at the time had a surgery and coming out of anesthesia, decided to reveal a secret life he'd been living the entirety of our marriage. A nuclear bomb landed in my lap, and then my mom got sick and unexpectedly died at 59. Everything I once knew was gone. God was it. His word was all that comforted me. The only way I could sleep was to listen to the Bible. The stress was unbearable. So much prayer, individual counseling, multiple marriage counselors. I joined a support group and I signed him up for an integrity group. I did everything I knew to do until one day I cried out, God, I can't do this anymore. You have to rescue me. And he did. I was six weeks pregnant with baby number 10 when the kids and I ended up in a domestic violence shelter. I spent the next few years white knuckling my faith and earnestly seeking God's direction. I filed for divorce. He made a last play that I briefly fell for and I found myself pregnant. I was humiliated and felt like I had disappointed everyone who had been helping me break free. I had no idea why God would add more life to my mess, but seven months later, on a beautiful sunny Saturday, 1,751 days ago, my daughter died in a car accident. Losing a child is, is a pain like no other. You feel it in the marrow of your bones. Had it not been for that baby I was carrying, no purpose would have been big enough to keep me going. I spent the next year basically in bed with that baby. The kids got by on peanut butter spoons and cereal. COVID hit and I was relieved. The pressure to leave my house was gone. Everyone was kept safe with me in our little cocoon, and I had that time to be broken. And then God started to rebuild. I wanted us back in church, but I couldn't muster the energy for what it takes to get a family this size to church in the morning. But a local church that had helped me at one point had an Easter service for the kids on a Saturday evening, followed by a service, and I could do that one step. During that service, they posed a three-week challenge. Come to their service for three weeks in a row to see if it's a good fit. It was just enough to get me going again. Another step. Then God opened up a job opportunity with a family member that had the flexibility I needed when I just couldn't face that day. Another step. He was restoring my strength. So by now, I'm sure you're asking, where's the light in all these dark places? And I would tell you that it's not in the places you would necessarily expect. It's in the laughter of the children that he kept me surrounded with. It's also in the way that God uses the very things meant to destroy you to bring about your healing. He used the grief of my brothers and mother to prepare me for the loss of my child. He used the breaking of my marriage to provide intensive counseling that brought healing from my childhood trauma that got me there in the first place. It was the newborn daughter he gave to pull me through the deep grief and the constant reminder that God has always been my sole provider. It was in the scriptures that he gave me at key points to renew my soul in desperate moments. It's in his perfect timing for everything, pain and joy. December 17, 2021, exactly seven years to the day 
of the destruction of an unholy marriage, he brought the beginning of a holy marriage. The gift of a godly man that had lost his family to a family that desperately needed a godly man and how we could bond in our grief. How in this new life, I regularly drive past the shelter that we stayed in, one of my altars in the wilderness that he led me through. It's how he prepared me for my promised land. It's how he makes broken lives intricately beautiful. It's how he taught me to be still and truly know that he is my God. My ears had heard of him, but now my eyes have seen him. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. I appreciate you coming on stage. And, uh, you know, as, as you listen to these stories, uh, the purpose of this message, uh, let's thank him one more time, actually, as they leave. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's simply this, that sometimes you have this idea that God, your relationship with God is going to go in an upward, straight line. And I want you to realize, I want every single person in this room to realize at our church that our story sometimes looks, you know, doesn't make sense. Like you go in all kinds of directions, but God is working through it all. The moments that you feel like you're getting closer and the moments that you don't see him. And so over the next uh, just few months as you're facing, and I imagine that we all face challenges, I want you to see God in those moments. And and thank you so much, ladies, for sharing your story. This is one of those things that, you know, there's so much scripture in there, they just didn't say it. They mentioned a few things, but in how God was working already in their lives, you know, it's just really the living out of the scriptures there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. We're going to take some time and sing, and, and, uh, and then we're going to take communion. But uh, we're going to just go to the Lord and ask Him that we can see Him over the next few weeks and months in the places where we haven't seen him before, even during the dark times in our lives, as he gets us through them uh, without us knowing. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, I pray that we can see you even when we don't feel you, that we can, Lord, be aware of your presence in our lives and how you're giving us strength, how you're shaping us, even without us knowing. The Lord, uh, as we come close to you, that we can hum, have humble hearts, that we can have those moments of surrender, Lord, before you, that just really shape our hearts after you, and that even through the pain or suffering or, Lord, uh, all the things that we endure many times because of just life, this broken world, or our own doing, that, Lord, we can just cling on to you and that we can see you in our lives. We thank you so much for who you are, Lord, and it's in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Would you stand up and let's worship. 